Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining our webinar tonight. I'm Corrine. I'm the Land Stewardship Coordinator with the Kensington Conservancy. I haven't met you yet. Hello. Um, so if you don't, if this is your first time uh, hearing about the Kensington Conservancy, I'll just give you a little background. We are a land trust that works to protect lands and waters in the St. Joseph Channel area by purchasing property, um, accepting donations of land, and creating voluntary conservation easements with landowners. And we were established in 2006, and we currently protect uh, 1,186 acres of land uh, in 11 nature preserves and two conservation easements. So before we begin, um, I'll just make sure everybody mutes themselves and turns their video off just to save on some uh, streaming, uh, we don't get bogged down. We've got lots of people joining today. And so to get started, I'm pleased to introduce Rob Perdon, who will be presenting tonight's webinar on the subject of mine rehabilitation in Ontario. Um, Rob is a geologist and geochemist with over 30 years of experience in mineral exploration, hydrogeology, geochemistry, environmental site assessment, and mine closure and rehabilitation. He's managed major mine re rehabilitation projects in Atacokan, Sudbury, and Renfrew, as well as numerous assessment and rehabilitation projects at smaller sites. He's a graduate of the Haleybury School of Mines and holds an undergraduate and graduate degrees in geology, sedimentology, and geochemistry from Lakehead University and resides in the Nebish area on the St. Mary's River. So with that, um, I will pass things over to Rob. And I'll, in the meantime, I will continue admitting people to the webinar. So Rob, um, the stage is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much, and and thanks everyone for for coming and, and showing an interest in this. Uh, it's uh, it, it's a subject that's near and dear to me, and um, I started really working in in mine closure uh, back in in two thousand nine. And if you were to take my resume and look at all the diverse things that I did in environmental science and geology and mining and um, chemistry and hydrogeology. And if you asked, well, would be a good job for this person? Well, it would be for uh, doing mine rehabilitation. And and um, I uh, I still have an interest in it, and I like sharing the knowledge on it. So, uh, welcome. Hopefully, um, this will be uh, informative, entertaining, and I don't uh, plan on taking a deep dive into all of this material. But there, um, uh, some of it gets technical, but I'm trying to keep it at a at a, at a suitable level and. Um, I, if I go too fast, it's because there's a lot of ground to cover. So uh, bear with me and uh, please save your questions for the end. I'll be uh, pleased to answer any questions or you could you can reach out and contact me privately and um, I'm more than happy to have a conversation. So um, with no further ado, we'll look at uh, at mine closure. Um, mining in Ontario has been around for a long period of time and I'm presenting this in, in provincial context. Uh, this is one of Ontario's first mines. This is the Silver Islet mine uh, near Thunder Bay. Um, and you can see some features here. There's the shaft. Uh, the uh, historic operation was right on the bed of Lake Superior. There was a small islet uh, and they built cribbing and dams around it and backfilled it um, so that the uh, they could sink the shaft into the silver vein and mine silver there. And uh, if you go over there today, um, you can actually take a boat right over top of the shaft. It's a little ominous where you there's this big opening kind of opens up underneath the water and it's all dark and it's kind of spooky. So that's how mining started in Ontario um, in, in, in the late um, 1800s. Fast forward uh, today to um, a, a modern mine. This is uh, the next image is of the Dyavik mine uh, in the Northwest Territories. Uh, it's a diamond mine, but uh, there's some similarities here. Uh, you can see that the mining infrastructure is projecting out into the lake, there's dams and water control structures around the mine site. Uh, and the mining is actually going on underneath the lake with other mine infrastructure. And, and I put these two up because they're diametrically opposed, and, um, but very similar. And so as much as uh, things have changed in the mining industry, many things have stayed the same. And uh, one of the lessons from this, this, uh, this talk I'm going to give is uh, if we don't learn 
from the lessons of the past will be bound to repeat them. And the, the thought is, is that uh, the industry is doing better. There's still room for improvement, but um, we need to recognize uh, the past and address them and move forward with uh, with modern mining um, and uh, in, in an environmentally and, and uh, sensitive manner. So uh, the presentation itself will give you an overview of the mining sequence, the regulatory environment, at least from the provincial perspective. Uh, we'll talk about abandoned mines, uh, physical hazards, underground openings, buildings and structures, open pits. And then we'll go into what is really the long lasting legacy issues related to mining. And that's uh, largely related to water quality and acid rock drainage and metal leaching. Um, how you characterize it, how you manage tailings and waste rock. And eventually we'll get to water treatment. Um, that's a, a big agenda, so I'll just, I'll keep moving here. Um, so mining, and, and I don't mean to be a cheerleader for the mining industry by any means, but mining is necessary for our current uh, lifestyle. Uh, it, uh, minerals are present in a food and health projects. Uh, uh, we need it to produce those cosmetics, fertilizers, all require minerals. Um, technology, the electronics, the, the devices that we're using right now to connect with each other electronically uh, require minerals and, um, and batteries uh, for transportation, for vehicles and infrastructure associated with transportation. We need steel. Um, we're moving more to an electronic vehicle system. We'll need uh, metals to, uh, to, to run the batteries for it. Uh, we'll need, we need it in construction uh, for structural steel and particularly for electrical. Uh, equipment and transfer of electricity from point A to point B um, requires a lot of copper wiring. Um, but it's also an economic force. It provides employment, it provides revenue for government through taxes, and the stock market in itself has grown into an industry that supports many people and lots of money changes hands and um, it's an economy in and of itself. So money is connected to all these things in our lifestyle. In Ontario, there's currently 35 mining operating mines and there's 16 significant projects underway. It's just uh, information that is available from the Ontario Mining Association. Um, Ontario mining revenues uh, were over $13 billion in uh, 2022, uh, which is about 2% of Ontario's uh, gross domestic product. So it's not insignificant. Um, over 31,000 Ontario workers are directly employed in the mining sector, and they um, earn $4.3 billion annually in wages. Now, mining jobs are highly technical, highly skilled, and uh, they're highly paid. Um, but the spinoffs from those wages earned uh, are almost tenfold in the community. So uh, when a mine locates near a community, it can have a very, very significant economic uplift to the community. And, um, it, uh, and, and this is why communities, particularly in northern Ontario, are attracted to mining and mining development. Um, mine development is in, uh, in and of itself is a financial undertaking. The definition of an ore is a mineral or commodity that can be extracted for a profit. And that's the key words there is extracted for a profit. Um, if there isn't sufficient revenue to be generated from a resource, then it, it won't be mined because it won't be economic to do so. And we'll get into more of the, the nuts and bolts of the uh, economy of mining in just a, just a few minutes. Um, bringing a mine into production takes at least 10 years and years of hard work and millions of dollars in investment. Uh, most mineral exploration projects do not move into advanced exploration and most advanced exploration projects don't move into uh, production. So there's, if you wanted to look at it from a, a success rate, it's very low uh, to take a mine from a grassroots project into a, uh, a fully producing operating mine. Um, and, the, and the length of time it takes is, is prohibitive. And there, there's lots of uh, things that can happen that uh, could prevent a mine from forming. So just because there's exploration going on in a certain area, it does not mean that a mine will be there. And in fact, the odds are stacked against any property um, becoming a, uh, a producing mine. Uh, the success rate is that low. Um, so this is a, a little slide. This is uh, courtesy of the Ministry of Northern Development, well, the Ministry of Mines now. Uh, this is from a uh, Mining 101 presentation that they, they have that's available on their website. Uh, but the, the mining sequence is laid out here. You go from exploration, development, production, and closure. So exploration starts with prospecting and staking. And, and most people, when you think about prospecting, you think of a guy with a donkey and, and, and a pickaxe and he's out there beating up rocks. But prospecting has evolved and, and most modern prospectors are now uh, geologists or have a highly sophisticated understanding of geology and, um, and, and 
um, the exploration process. Uh, staking has moved from uh, cutting uh, lines in the bush and cutting posts uh, to uh, map staking and doing that electronically. Um, so once you've acquired a property through prospecting and staking and you get into grassroots exploration, this is where I, I really enjoyed this, this part of my career was when we were out in the bush uh, walking along with a map and compass. So today you'd be using a GPS and compass um, and finding outcrops and logging what the rock types were and finding uh, mineralization. And if you found a, a property that uh, was uh, had the right mineralization and the right geology, um, you would move into advanced exploration. And this is things like where you're doing trenching and removing overburden and stripping and uh, diamond drilling to expose the rocks and do sampling and collect core samples of the rock for uh, geochemical analysis and mineralogical analysis. And then once you amass all that and you, you define what an ore body is and how big it is and what the tonnage is and, and what the ore grade is, then you look at the economics of it and you look at the feasibility, how much is it going to cost us to bring that into production versus how much that resource is actually worth worth at uh, the current market uh, value and future market, market production. Um, and then um, all along through this uh, advanced exploration, you're doing environmental studies, you're establishing the environmental baseline uh, for uh, plant and animal species, vegetation, uh, as well as uh, surface and groundwater quality. And through that, there's the regulatory process where you get your permits and approvals uh, to uh, proceed with them. And the next stage is construction. Uh, and that's when you actually physically construct the, uh, the infrastructure needed for, um, for mineral production. And then you move into mining. But the key thing here is, is all this effort, all this effort here is where the mining company is expending capital. This is costing money. And all this work has to be funded in advance of the mine going into production. And the funding comes from speculation that the return on this investment will be big enough to cover these costs. And then we move on into uh, the mining. And the mine is operational for, uh, for a length of time. Most mines stay in production for 20 years now, maybe 30 if uh, they're lucky. Um, Hemlo's beating the odds. Uh, the mines there are almost into 40 years of production. And they were initially um, thought that they, they would have 20 to 25 years of ore when they went into production in the mid 80s. Um, and during that time, the mine is making money. And then when you move into closure, the ore gets depleted and it's no longer economic to mine. Uh, then you move into site rehabilitation. And, and then you're, you're into a phase where you're actually spending money again. And, and this also has to be accounted for in the feasibility study back over here, because your closure costs have to be accounted for in the, uh, the capital that is made from the mine while it's in production. And site rehabilitation can go on for a long time because there may be uh, monitoring uh, water treatment and, um, and those types of activities that extend for an extended period of time uh, after the mine closure. And again, that's a, that's a period of time where you're, you're spending money. Uh, and overriding all this, and I like how this, uh, this is put at the top of, the, um, of this slide, is, is consultation. And this is, uh, begins uh, ideally at the early stages of um, exploration, where you're consulting with indigenous communities and groups, Métis communities and groups, as well as local communities and local citizens. Um, and this is what mining companies refer to as getting the, the social license to operate. And um, this is where discussions about how the mining will how the mine will proceed, how they're going to mitigate impacts related to it, and um, how they're going to protect uh, plant and animal species uh, and ground to surface water quality. And, and that consultation really never ends because it projects past, the mine operational stage and projects into closure and, and goes uh, hand in hand with the site rehabilitation. So getting back to the first stage of mining in mineral exploration, um, and then the regulatory environment for that um, is governed under Ontario Regulation 308, um, where uh, exploration permits or exploration plans are required for what they describe as uh, uh, what they say are the prescribed activities such as mechanized drilling, which would be diamond drilling, um, mechanized surface stripping, line cutting, or pitting or trenching. Um, 
and there's requirements in the plans and permits uh, for Indigenous uh, consultation and Métis consultation. Uh, there are also uh, provincial standards for mineral exploration, which includes rehabilitation of exploration sites, particularly things like drill pads, uh, where there's, there's fuels and sludges from drilling that need to be collected and, and managed. Um, and the director under the Mining Act has an authority to place additional terms and conditions on the permit. So the permits are very important documents. And they're, they're also, um, uh, they have to be posted on the environmental registry. So if there's a mineral exploration activity occurring near you, it's quite likely that if you did a search of the environmental registry in Ontario, you can Google it and log in and see. Um, it's an instrument that is posted there for a 30 day period for public comment. Um, and those comments have to be considered and any concerns have to be mitigated uh, through that process. So um, the plans and permits came in in 2012 and, and um, it's, a, it's a mechanism to facilitate Indigenous consultation, but it's also a mechanism for uh, the public to participate in um, planning and commenting on mineral exploration projects. And then after the mines in, uh, in operation, when we move into closure, um, under the Ontario Mining Act, um, no mine can go into production unless there's a closure plan on file with the Ministry of Mines. And what goes into a mine closure plan is prescribed by Ontario Regulation 240-00. Um, and you need to have provisions for things like closures of the openings to surface, removal of surface infrastructure, um, addressing water quality, acid rock drainage and metal leaching, uh, long-term management and closure of the tailings ponds and waste rock piles and, uh, and revegetation of the site. Um, and through that process, the mining companies also have to estimate uh, the costs it re will require them to uh, implement that closure plan. And they have to post a bond called financial insurance for it. And um, they cannot go into production until the, the closure plan is filed and uh, financial assurance has been provided. And the financial assurance is held by the Crown um, in the event that the um, mining company is unwilling or unable to undertake mine rehabilitation um, at some point when they, when they cease operations. And I had the, the fortune or, or misfortune, as some would say, of um, having to manage two projects uh, for the province where the, um, the property returned to the Crown uh, due to the insolvency of the, um, the mining company. And I had to implement uh, the closure plan using the financial assurance that was held by the Crown. That was, they were the first two that, uh, that came in the door. There's been a couple since, but I had uh, the opportunity to uh, directly participate in that, in that process. So um, the requirement for closure plans uh, it came into fruition in, in the year 2000. But prior to 2000, uh, the mining companies uh, can only be described as enjoying a uh, unfettered access uh, to uh, lands in, in the province. And uh, they were, um, without any regulatory constraints, they were largely allowed to abandon properties uh, without implementing closure prior to that. Although um, in the 80s and 90s, uh, there was a lot of voluntary uh, closure that was occurring. But uh, there are over 5,700 abandoned mine sites in Ontario right now. And on those 5,700 sites, there's 17,000 mine features, which are described as mine hazards. Now, these, uh, these hazards um, exist in size from small exploration sites with a, you know, a little pit that was blasted that's no bigger than um, an office desk uh, or, or trenches that are, are just really shallow scratches on the, on the surface. Uh, to large scale operations where full size mines with many large and complex mine hazards. And, and those still exist on the, on the landscape today. Um, this is what it looks like. Uh, this is from, uh, this slide is a Google Earth image and it's from the abandoned mines information system. And it's a layer in Google Earth that's uh, um, available from the uh, Ontario Geological Survey. And all those white and blue dots that you see there are abandoned mine sites. That's the 5,700 mine sites that you see there. And there, if you click on those in the layer, you can get boilerplate information about when the mine was active, what the commodity was, um, and what some of the hazards are. 
and uh, you can see that there's a high density in some areas, and those those areas are are mine hazards um, are clustered uh, almost according to the geology. So the geology drives it. Where there's minerals to be mined, that's where the mines are located. Um, up in the north here, um, access is an issue, and in the lowlands, uh, it's very difficult to explore. There's not that many yield crops, and uh, and finding mines up there is 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 a little bit harder. But um, these are all the abandoned mines in Ontario. Now, a little bit closer to home and the Sault Ste. Marie area. Um, this is, uh, again, a Google, Google Earth image from uh, the abandoned mines information system. And then again, you see the locations of all the abandoned mine sites in our area. And here's Sault Ste. Marie, uh, St. Joseph Island, uh, Deborah, Bruce Mines, Esalon, and Blind River here. Uh, so north of the uh, north of the Great Lakes and the, the St. Mary's River, there's actually been quite a bit of mining activity. Now, I'm sharing this information. It's publicly available, um, and I would encourage you not to use it as a shopping list for cool places to go and see. Um, abandoned mines are quite hazardous, and the next stage of my uh, presentation will be a, a little bit of a, a run through of some of the hazards and and how they appear on these abandoned mine sites. Um, Physical hazards include underground openings. Uh, that they could be shafts, vertical shafts. They could be open cuts where they mined a vein out and it's like a canyon wall. And um, or there could be an adit where a tunnel goes into the side of a, a hill. Um, and it can be um, uh, significant risks associated with uh, ground stability. Um, underground openings find spaces, so there could be air quality issues. Um, the, the breakdown of organic material like timbers and leaf litter can uh, generate uh, hydrogen sulfide uh, or carbon monoxide. Um, a lot of mine openings are colonized by bats, at least as roots at roosting sites, if not as a hibernaculum. Uh, bats excrete guano and bat guano carries um, parasites that are hazardous to humans. So uh, the guano dries out and if you walk through the guano, it stirs up dust, which you then inhale and you can get quite ill from it. Um, the other issue is open pits. Uh, these are large open holes in the ground where the rock has been uh, mined out. Unstable pit walls. Um, usually they're filled with contaminated or impacted water and there's limited egress. They, they have steep sides and if you go in it's, it can, or if you fall in or enter inadvertently, it can be very hard for you to, uh, to, to get out safely. Um, the other thing, and this applies to all mine hazards, is that the, the site conditions are dynamic. They change between site visits. So just because you went to a mine site the previous year, or the previous summer, or four years ago, uh, it doesn't mean that it stayed constant. And something that appeared safe um, may not be safe uh, the next time you go and visit. And sometimes those changes can be very subtle to the untrained eye. Uh, mine sites also have uh, buildings and infrastructure and because they're abandoned structures, uh, there's issues related to structural stability. Um, there's often hazardous materials, uh, asbestos, lead, mold. Often they're colonized by animals. Uh, bats and, and pigeons um, and other species uh, will excrete their guano. And again, it creates problems um, if you inhale the dust from uh, dry feces. And the other aspect um, of, of mining um, are the tailings areas, uh, the dams and water control structures. Uh, tailings areas have contaminated water or at least contact water. Uh, it can be contaminated with metals, uh, low pH. Uh, cyanide is often used in, in gold uh, production. So if it's an old gold mine or they, if they extracted gold from it, uh, there's a chance that the water will contain traces or residual cyanide. Um, and they're also decaying, it's decaying infrastructure. So dams that haven't been maintained uh, may have washed out. They may be structurally unstable. The tailings themselves may be unstable. And they're not particularly safe places to go. Um, abandoned mine sites also become popular for mineral collecting. This is a slide from a, uh, a former mine site in the Bancroft area that was a pop prop popular mineral collecting site. Now, what's interesting here, you see where the person's standing. Um, this was a pillar of rock that used to extend out here and supported this whole slab. And over the years, uh, rock pickers have chiseled away at it and eaten away at this, uh, this pillar. And it's progressively gotten smaller over time. 
and it has this became a very dangerous place for people to go and uh, this was a crown held site so the project was to uh, fill this opening up with uh, coarse rock and to then put uh, topsoil and material on it but the opening had also been um which are much more extensive than what you see here um the, the openings had also been colonized by bats and um so they had to create a safe ingress and egress for the bats so they they, they put in this concrete tunnel and then about halfway across into the tunnel there's a uh, high tensile stainless steel grate that prevents people from getting in there and uh, but it allows the bats to enter and leave the the workings and that was actually a, a hibernaculum i believe so um the other thing is the dynamic nature of openings this is a, a site in northwestern ontario it's a on an island on a, on a very popular and populous uh, uh, lake with, with many, many cottages. And this is a, 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 a spot that's frequented by people. They land by boat and go and explore the old mine workings. And this is an open cut. You can kind of see this as a canyon. It goes up about 25 meters. And at one time, this was all covered with dirt and people would walk across here. And then one day this hole opened up and this hole that you see here uh, is a, a 300 foot deep uh, shaft and uh, it's uh, it goes down approximately 300 feet there's about a water at about 100 feet below this and you can see the timbers are all rotted away and there were timbers across here that have failed and that's what caused this thing to fall in so for years people walked across here and they thought it was perfectly safe and then one day this opened up but that didn't just deter them because they put this birch log in here. And if you look at the birch log, it's, it's not in the best shape in and of itself. And yet they continue to walk through here. And the tenure here isn't that this is a crown site, but this is, this is my picture I took this. Um, and, and you can see that, you know, a site that maybe the year before you'd gone to visit and walk through here and now has a large opening here. And you, you don't know unless you have the engineer drawings that show where these things are located that this could occur. So. Uh, be very, very careful when you're um, exploring old, old mine workings. Um, the other thing is you, you'll come across in the bush these abandoned shafts if you're walking through and around um, old mine sites. And if you're a Star Wars fan like I am, this is like the Sarlacc pit where, where Luke fought off Jabba the Hutt's minions and, and Boba Fett fell in. And this is a great cone shaped depression that goes down to the shaft and you can see the uh, the timbers here that's about a couple hundred feet deep and it's filled with water to about uh, another hundred feet below the surface. And if you lock your footing here and now I'm standing further back and I zoomed in to take this picture. Um, if you lost your footing you just go in and you wouldn't be able to come out and because this is on an island on a lake. Um, water temperature at the bottom of the shaft is probably about four degrees Celsius. Um, and it's quite likely that if you survive the fall, um, you'd succumb to hypothermia before an effective uh, rescue effort could be uh, mobilized. The other thing too is these, in, in the, in, 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 trying to close these off, people would put, um, the, you know, the mine owners or other people would put barbed wire around them and they would attach it to the trees or fence posts around. But these have been out of service and that, that fencing hasn't been maintained. So the posts or the trees have rotted and fallen over and that barbed wire is lying on the ground in the leaf litter. And it's brown, it's rusty brown, same color as the leaves that you see here. So it's quite likely that you're walking towards it. Uh, you may not see the barbed wire and the barbed wire would hook your foot and you would trip and then fall into the shop. So sometimes the hazards are there and you don't even know they're there. And uh, you have to be very, very careful with your footing um, if you're, you're walking in areas where there was mining activity historically. Uh, the other thing is subsidence. Um, these two shots are from the Karatsen mine in Kirkland Lake. Uh, this is a well-known subsidence feature. Um, at one time, this is what they, they call the crown pillar. And this was a, uh, the rock that was left uh, above the mine workings. And it, um, the mine workings didn't originally come to surface, but because of structural instability in the, um, in the rock, the surface has collapsed into the mine workings and it's continuing to collapse. These are, this is an active um, failing surface here. 
and the subsidence feature is getting larger. And there was mineral exploration activity going on there. That's why I was there in 2015. And I was walking up the road um, and I noticed these features. I'm not sure if you can see it very well, but in the, the right hand image, you can see something running along here where my cursor is going. And there's a more pronounced one here. Those are tension cracks. So the road that they were using to access their mineral exploration site was actually becoming part of the, of the subsidence feature. And um, we actually had to get them to, to find another route into their exploration site because this was no longer uh, safe to use. And all I did was put my notebook down and take the picture and I, um, I left the area because um, that's a sign of uh, deep seated structural instability. And um, you don't want to be anywhere near a subsidence feature like that when there's tension cracks like this um, along the edges. Uh, just the, the vibration of your footprints could cause um, a sudden collapse of that. Um, that can also be present on dams. If a, if a dam's starting to fail, you can see tension cracks on the top of dam surfaces. And if you see those, you know you don't want to be there very long. I mean, it's, I don't want to lecture everybody, but <laughs> people go to these things and they, uh, uh, they put themselves at risk. Um, open pits. Again, the, the, the pit walls, this is an open pit. This is in British Columbia. Um, originally, these walls were, for, uh, were, were vertical, and these are what they call the benches, and this is what created a stable landscape while the mine was in operation. But the mine's closed now, and these are no longer maintained or engineered, and you can see that the pit slopes are starting to fail and fall in, and here's, here's a, um, a partial failure right here where my cursor is. And uh, typically for an open pit, um, it's filling up with water, and you can see that, that this water is a funny looking green color. And we'll, we'll get to water quality further on in the presentation, but just trust me that that's highly impacted uh, mine contact water. And um, if you were to go in there, um, the, uh, you'd be in contact with the water, and egress would be very difficult. Um, now, typically, um, the closure for an open pit is you put a rock berm around it, and you can see the top of the berm here, or a rock wall that warns you. Um, and typically on a road that's burned off, you'll see a quad runner trail going over the top of it. And uh, the, uh, this, is a, this is the sign that was there. It says, danger of death, deep soft mud, old mine workings. But I thought the, the graphic was quite telling. They show a snowmobile here launching itself over the berm. Um, and you know, the berm is there and um, ideally the engineers have assessed the, uh, the rock mechanics and the berm is set far enough back from the pit, pit edge that you're in the safe ground and that you're outside the potential failure envelope of the of the pit. If you go past the berm, you're now into the danger zone where subsidence is likely to occur. So respect these berms. Um, they're there to protect you from um, high risk areas. And the other thing too is um, you see this sign that says private property to keep out. In the land tenure in Ontario, um, mines were often on uh, either mining leases or uh, mining patents, and you'll also see um, uh, mining lands on the um, on land title. Now, patented lands are held in fee simple, like you and I would be property owners. And uh, if the land is still patented land, that means that somebody owns it. And so, if you're accessing a mine site that's on patented land, it's quite likely that you're trespassing because you don't have the permission of the owner. And so a lot of times they're posted private property keep out. And so going on to an abandoned mine site that's posted private property or no trespassing, um, not only are you exposing yourself to potential hazards, uh, but you also may be trespassing. Um, and Ontario can um, bar the public from entering lands that are hazardous under the Public Lands Act. And you can also be charged with trespassing under the Public Lands Act. So if you see one of these signs, the, um, the collective wisdom is that the, the area is uh, um, too hard for, or too dangerous for people to visit now, or the area that you're trying to access is too dangerous. And uh, not only are you putting yourself potentially at physical risk, but you're also putting yourself at, uh, at a, a certain legal risk. Yeah. Surface hazards include um, a surface infrastructure left by the mine site. Now this is a mine, uh, again, it's uh, near Timmins, and I actually worked at this mine site uh, back in 1984 
Uh, this uh, was, um, and the mine went into uh, closure in, in 85 and, and I no longer worked there and then it went back into production. So um, this is outside the mill area and you can see these drums here. And uh, what's in interesting in these drums is you see these blue and white drums that are stacked on top of each other. Those are cyanide barrels. Um, typically in mining, uh, in metal and gold mining, uh, the cyanide, uh, the sodium cyanide was stored in uh, blue drums with white stripes on the side, so they stood out uh, from fuel drum. Um, and you can see what the containment is here. Uh, it's a kiddie pool. Uh, so this is how that, that site was left. Um, and uh, the other thing is, is, is that, you know, you, you run into these hazardous materials on, on old mine sites and if they're abandoned, they probably weren't stored properly, or they may have been vandalized, or um, other things. I mean, maybe the containment has corroded. Maybe the containment's only a kiddie pool. Um, the other thing is, is the old tailings areas, and you can see this is the tailings area here, and you can see the um, the water is flowing through it. But you can also see that there's quad runner or dirt bike trails on here, and in a dry time, this might be okay. They might have gotten away with it, but. If you look at this drainage channel, first you can see that the water is a bright red, and that's a giveaway that the, the, the water is, is impacted. But you see this, uh, this, this, this greasy or slimy look that it has to it. That means it's, it's very fine material. And a lot of times when, the water, when fine material gets saturated, it becomes literally quicksand. And although you can walk out on this crusty stuff, you may break through and become mired. And you know, if you're by yourself, that could be very hazardous. Or, if you're out there on your piece of equipment, your quad runner, your side by side or dirt bike, um, even a mountain bike, um, you could lose your equipment or you could become putting yourself at risk and you could be coming into contact with uh, with mine impacted water. Um, this is another shot of the tailings. These are coarser materials here, but you can also see that this bright rusty uh, red color is due to iron uh, impacts there. Uh, the surface infrastructure also includes uh, things like head frames uh, and shaft services and administrative buildings uh, in addition to the mill. Uh, this is from a, a mine site in the Sudbury area. Um, modern head frame, uh, poured concrete, reinforced concrete, about 300 feet high. Uh, for, uh, steel uh, head frame, this is uh, at the same mine site, they had two head frames. Uh, the more classic head frame look to it. Um, this corrugated material is asbestos siding. Uh, it's called transite. Uh, so if you see that material, you'll know that asbestos materials were used in the construction of the site. And it may not be worthwhile to, to go into them um, because you could be, be exposing yourself to asbestos. Uh, the size and scale of these structures in, in modern mining, mining is done big. And uh, you can see this is the, the vehicle sized entrance and the person sized door. And there's actually a person standing with a uh, orange uh, jacket over in the background. So. The structures are big, um, and uh, when they're abandoned, uh, they fall into disrepair, and uh, they can be full of uh, hazardous material. So um, this is a mine site near Renfrew that I was involved with. Uh, these are heating pipes, and these circular things here are asbestos insulation on the um, on the piping here, the copper piping. Now what happened here was uh, uh, scavengers went in there and they would take uh, a sawzall and just cut off the copper pipe and they slid the bats of insulation off in the mine building and, and, and took off with the pipe. Um, copper prices are pretty high and, and it, it's attractive to scavengers to make a buck. Uh, but they left this material sitting on the ground in, in one of the buildings and the, and the building was, was compromised uh, structurally for water and all the material got wet and the stuff turned to a mush and then in the summer it dried out and it turned into this this fine powder and i saw footprints going through it uh, so somebody had walked through this asbestos powder uh, sitting on the floor in the mine building i'm probably unaware that it was asbestos material um, likewise in the uh, this is a, a picture from the uh, the locker room um, you can see the steel girders. Um, these are uh, asbestos cement boards on the roof here. There's mold here, there's water damage, and you can see the paint peeling off here. Lead paint was used extensively in um, old mine buildings. And so this lead paint is actively peeling off uh, the walls and it's falling on the floor. And then it's grounding and getting ground into dust when people walk by. 
Um, and the risk there is that you're inhaling this material. So you're inhaling lead dust, you're inhaling um, asbestos containing materials. You may be hit inhaling vectors produced by the guano from um, animal colonization. Um, and because these scavengers are at work in here, they could have knocked holes in walls, they could have cut out structural members to access the materials they were after. Um, in addition to the decay that can occur when a building's left unheated for extended periods of time. So um, the buildings themselves become hazards and they have to be taken down. So hopefully this works. Um, I may have to switch screens here. So uh, yeah, hang on a second. Hold on. Uh, new share. Let's see. Here we go. And can everybody see the uh, the head frame there? Just give me a thumbs up or something. I can only see the just the screen with the link on it. Okay, hang on a sec. Um, how's that? Yep, there it is. Okay. Um, turn your sound up. I, I had to I had to show that that's so impressive. <laughs> okay. Um, let me go back to uh, stop share and then, um, Are we back to the uh, the YouTube link there. Yep. Yeah, that's okay. good. So that was the Frude Stobie head frame demolition and not all mine buildings come down that dramatically, but uh, the, the big head frames do. And that's what they did at the, the head frame that, of, of the site that I was involved with. Unfortunately, I can't send you the, uh, show you the video of that one, but the head frame at that site was identical to the one you just saw drop just like a tree. But all the other buildings have to be torn down and all the hazardous materials removed and the metals removed and um, the, uh, the debris hauled to a, a licensed landfill. Um, and that, that's almost the easy part of um, mine rehabilitation because um, the long-term legacy of mining, uh, you can deal with the, the hazards of the openings, you can deal with the buildings, um, you can even revegetate the site. But if you've got geological materials that will produce contamination, then you've got a long-term legacy issue that needs to be is, is acid rock drainage and metal leaching. And in short, um, the sulfide minerals, uh, which are usually pyrite, um, and there's a, there's a sample of pyrite that I threw up there. Uh, it's also known as fool's gold, but other metals form with, uh, with sulfur to form minerals, uh, copper, nickel, zinc, iron, all form uh, sulfides and they're very common um, in mineralized zones. Um, and the sulfide mineralization will react with water and oxygen to produce sulfuric acid. Then the acidic conditions tend to leach other metals out of the waste rock and the tailings piles. And this can be a persistent and long-term legacy issue related to metal mining. Now, the good news is that the issue is fairly well understood and there's good science behind how to characterize uh, the potential for acid rock drainage and for mitigating the impacts, and we'll get to that. So um, this is what acid rock drainage looks like. Um, this is, a, we called this the red pond. This was a, again, one, one mine rehabilitation project that I was involved with. And essentially all this, uh, this, this pile of material up here on the other side of the pond is, um, has uh, a lot of uh, iron sulfide in it. And the, the water, rainwater falls on it and percolates through and emerges here. And it, uh, the reactions take place so that uh, the, um, the pyrite reacts with water and oxygen and it produces this, this low pH water. 
uh, pH in this pond was um, generally around 1.7 and high metals, and particularly iron and arsenic. Um, and you really don't want to mess around with arsenic if you're a human being. Um, this is from a mine site in uh, Sudbury. Um, very similar situation here, but a, a different result because of the mineralogy. The waste rock pile is, is up in the background here, and the water falling on it would percolate through the pile. The reactions would occur. The a drainage would emerge from the toe of the pile and come into this collection pond here. Uh, this is what we called, um, you know, we had a great big imagination, so we called this the ravine pond. And uh, this had a pH of about one and a half, um, and it had really high metals, uh, in particular nickel, copper, and zinc. And actually, the, 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 co the concentrations of those metals were in the two to 3,000 ppm range. And we actually considered at one time looking at this as, well, could we actually collect this and uh, send it to electrolysis and recover the metals? And, and that wasn't feasible, but that's how high the concentrations were. Um, we were doing some pumping here, and a, a pumping line failed, and I got sprayed with that water. And uh, within a couple hours, I had a skin reaction. Uh, due to the low pH in the metals there. Um, so contact with this water, even incidental contact, um, can cause uh, problems. So uh, just be aware that you know, if, if, if the water is, appears to be impacted, it is. Um, and sometimes if it doesn't appear to be impacted, it also is. So mine contact water should be treated with caution. Uh, so how does this occur? We have uh, pyrite or sulfide materials, oxygen and water. And so um, you need all three. This is like the fire triangle. You know, you need fuel, which would be the, um, the sulfide material. You need oxygen and you need a heat source. And instead of a heat source, we'll add water. And then we will get acid rock rain. And just like with the fire triangle, if you remove the fuel, you don't, you can't have a fire. So if there's no sulfide material, then you don't have to really worry about acid rock drainage. You may have to worry about um, metal leaching, but you don't have to worry about the acidity. Uh, if you don't have oxygen, again, the reactions won't occur and you won't have um, acid rock drainage. And if you can remove water, again, you don't have the reactions. So you have to break the triangle. Um, and so the most common techniques to do this are um, to cover and cap the material, whether it be tailings or waste rock, uh, with, uh, with a low permeability material that would inhib inhibit the inflow of oxygen and water into the pile and then would stop the reaction. Ideally, it would do both and, and protect against both. There's no uh, cover is perfectly designed, but uh, you want to limit the amount of oxygen and water available. And the other solution is to submerge the material in water. Now, you just you might say, well, Rob, you just told us that, you know, water was bad. And I said, well, the thing is, is that if you submerge it in water, the concentrations of dissolved oxygen in water are much less than what we have in air. Air is about 20, 22% oxygen and, um, and water has way less oxygen. So submerging it in water removes the oxygen and the reactions won't occur. But it's also to have high pH in metals. And this is uh, from the site in Renfrew. And this is a completely different geology here. Um, these are the tailings. Uh, they were dry stacked. Um, they weren't impounded in a tail in a, in a, behind a dam. And uh, this was a calcium magnesium dolomite. So it was calcium magnesium and carbonate. And they calcined this in, in large kilns uh, with, with air. And air is about 70% uh, thereabouts uh, uh, NO2. Uh, so the, uh, the air itself acted as a source of the contaminant. And the nitrogen adhered to the carbonate particle. And then uh, percolating rainwater um, hydrated it, and it became ammonia. And it dropped the pH, uh, well, it raised the pH, I should say. And the pH in this water, this slimy green mess you see here, um, was about 11, and the ammonia concentrations were up around 500 parts per million. And you can see the date stamp on the photo here. This was uh, in August, uh, towards the end of August, and it was a hot summer day. Uh, the off-gassing of ammonia from this, this drainage ditch, I'm standing on a little bridge across it, 
um, was so high that my eyes started to water and I had to vacate the area because the, uh, the ammonia concentrations were so high. Ammonia is toxic to fish. So, um, and uh, lots of other aquatic life. Um, so this can also occur. So it, it's not always low pH um, and, and metals. It could also be high pH in metals as well, depending, and a lot depends on the nature of the material that you're working with and the nature of the wastes that are there. So how do we do this? How do we characterize um, the geological materials so that we can prevent the onset of these? Uh, and one, one researcher from uh, 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 Quebec University uh, said, we have to stop building reactors. And that struck home with me because that's essentially what a waste rock pile or a tailings uh, impoundment can, com can become. They can become reactors to produce acid rock drainage. Um, so the key is, is and it, the old adage of an ounce of prevention is a, worth a pound of cure. It, you need to adequately characterize the geochemistry before operations even commence. So if we go back to that, that early slide that I showed in the mining sequence, when you're doing your mineral exploration and all your diamond drilling, you need to characterize the nature of the geology and the mineralogy of the site so that you know if you're going to get acid rock drainage um, as a problem or metal leaching as a problem uh, in the post-closure stage. And that requires chem extensive chemical sampling and mineralogical analysis. And then ongoing assess uh, sampling and assessment during operations so that you know when you're encountering that, encountering these materials in the mining sequence so that you can segregate them and put them in areas and manage them so that they, you don't have the onset of acid generating conditions. So this is a, an example of how you do this during uh, exploration and operations. This first little image uh, shows uh, what, what they call a block diagram of an ore body. And it, this blob is actually the ore zone. And these curving lines you see come through here are diamond drill holes. So they do diamond drilling to determine where the ore lies and how you know what the ore grade is and how big it is and, and where the mineable areas are. But they can also use the core to characterize where the acid generating materials are. And they can plan where they're where and when they're going to encounter those in the mining sequence. And they incorporate that also into the block diagram. And then they operationalize it. And I'm just going to bring up these three pictures here. And this is a this is a mine in northeastern Ontario. It's currently operating. It's a gold mine. And I'll take you down to the lower image here. And this is a, this is a, a borehole drilling machine here. And they're drilling the blast holes. And the technician here is collecting the cuttings from the, cell, uh, from the drill hole. And you can see them all lined up here. And they're, they're going for analysis for total carbon, total sulfur, um, to determine the, um, whether or not the material will be acid generated. Um, and then they, they, they send this to the engineers and the engineers will lay out a plan. Um, and that's what this diagram is here on the left. And the green areas are uh, non-acid generating waste rock that can be put aside for construction purposes or um, and stored safely with very little um, controls because it's, it's very low risk. Uh, the red stuff is um, acid generating materials and the pink stuff is uh, potentially acid generating materials, which at this mine they treated as acid generating. And then yellow, of course, because this was a gold mine, yellow is the ore zone. Um, and so it's very simply laid out by color and everybody understands the color scheme. But they take it one step more. Everybody has this as part of their morning briefing and they're, they're, you know, this shows where they're mining, where they're gonna be excavating. And then they lay it out on the ground. And this is that, that same area of the mine where they're working in here is laid out on the ground here. And although it's difficult to see, you might see some pinkish lines here and that's flagging tape. And all of these zones in this diagram here are laid out here on the uh, on the blasted rock and then they have dedicated equipment to remove the materials a dedicated uh, dump truck so the, the load, this loader is loading ore and that that dump truck will have um, will be dedicated to haul the material to the the mill for processing um, and uh, let's assume that this 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 uh, this hole is uh, uh, loading uh, waste rock and it'll go into a dump truck that has a GPS transponder and a tracking system that will take it to the uh, acid generating storage area so that it can, uh, you know, it's lined and there's engineering controls on it and it's being constructed to limit that flow of oxygen and water into it. So it will prevent 
the long-term uh, potential for it to generate acidity. Um, and this is a very sophisticated uh, state of the art. And you have the, the, the geologists, the geochemists, the mine planners, um, the field technicians, um, and the operational mining staff, the supervisors, and right down to the um, equipment operators in a highly sophisticated scheme uh, where everybody knows what is going on. You're uh, well trained. Um, and then you have electronic controls on it as well. And um, this, this is how. Uh, those materials can be hand handled safely and characterized uh, before they go into operations. Uh, a plan put into place during operations and then proper storage uh, following uh, their, their extraction from the ground. So then we move on to mine tailings. Um, this is a, uh, uh, again, a mine from north northeastern Ontario. We're standing on the tailings dam. This is an impoundment. It's like a, a water dam. Um, it has a clay core, um, and then it's it's built and buttressed with rock. And this this pipe you see coming in from the side is carrying the tailings. Now, when when you process rock for uh, mineral extraction, you grind it up really fine, and uh, you run it through um, a, a mill that extracts the valuable material from it, and it produces this waste material. And it's it's finely ground. It's it's uh, at best a coarse sand, but at, at most times it's a very fine grind, uh, depending on the nature of the operation and how far down they have to grind it to liberate the ore from it. And then they spigot it into the tailings area, and that's literally what they do. It's just dumping out here, and this is all confined and contained. Um, the coarse material settles out near the tailings dam, and then the fine materials are carried out. And you can see the the liquid here will be decanted for treatment. This is during uh, operations. So these things can be very big. Um, tailings dams have been in the news a lot. Uh, you know, I think everybody may have heard about Mount Pauly and, and the, the large tailings dams with the tragic loss of life in, in uh, South America. Um, well, there's three main ways that tailings dams are constructed. Uh, the most common way is the upstream method. Um, you start out with a, a starter dam, they call it. And then you raise the dam periodically um, as you, you go along. And the reason they do this is because structurally the dam wouldn't be stable um, on both sides if they just constructed the dam freestanding. The dam is designed to hold back the impoundment and it would collapse into itself without the back pressure. So you have to raise the dam in stages. So they, they start here and then the next phase of the dam goes inland, it goes upstream and uh, it actually sits on top of the tailings and the third race and the fourth race. Um, this is the, the cheapest way to do it from a materials perspective, but it has the downside that your um, tailings area gets smaller over time. And from a geotechnical perspective, you're building sections of your dam over top of tailings. And unless you're 100% sure of the structural integrity of the material that these these things are sitting on. I mean, these are massive slabs of uh, blasted rock. Um, there could be failures due to that, especially in extreme precipitation events. I mean, um, so the, the next next method that they uh, they use is the centerline method, where they build the dams literally right on top of each other. This has the advantage of buttressing the downstream side with new material, and so the, your downstream side gets bigger. Um, and, and more structurally sound as the tailings rise up and you have a good um, structural foundation on which you're building the dam. This is more expensive because you're, you're using more material to construct the dam, uh, but it, it may be geotechnically more stable over the long term. And then the, the, the last uh, downstream method is the, the last one and it's the most expensive one to create. You start with your starter dam and then you build downstream. It has the advantage of making your tailings area larger as you go along, so your, your uh, capacity for tailings increases over time. And you're making this massive buttress um, downstream. This is advantageous in a lot of open pit mines uh, where they have an excess of material. But again, this has to be material that's uh, geotechnically suited and geochemically suited for that. Um, and uh, it may be going forward one of the ways that we see the mining industry go, but we still see all three of these currently depending on the economics of it and the suitability of the material. Um, 
once you get your tailings and waste rock in place, you want to inhibit that inflow of oxygen and the inflow of water to it. So we generally place a cover over it. Um, and uh, typically, the more sophisticated your cover gets, um, the you get better performance out of it, but it's at a higher cost. And remember, we go back to that feasibility and the profitability of the mine. But, but so the, the simplest you know, is a, a cover of granular material um, or um, or waste rock and then revegetation. And then we get into capillary break layers, um, alternative cover material, and multi-layer barriers at the highest end. Um, this is a real world example of a multi-layer uh, cover design. And this is, uh, this is you know, if I can use the term, at the Cadillac solution here. Um, wasn't at the Cadillac mine, it was at the Camp Kosher mine, uh, uh, east of Timmins. Um, you have the tailings layer at the bottom, and then you, you put a, uh, a coarse capillary break. This is coarse rock. What happens with uh, moisture, with tailings that, are, that have water in them, the voids between the rocks wick the, the moisture up through all the, the nooks and crannies around the rock. And it can uh, actually migrate um, contaminated water up through the column. So the coarse material breaks that capillary action. So they, they put this material down. And then to um, make it suitable for construction and even out surfaces and for surface drainage and grading, um, they put a layer of granular B material, which is um, commonly known as pit mud, um, unsorted, uh, just gravel or gravelly sand. And then there was a geotextile clay. So that's an engineered clay geomembrane. And uh, that could also be high density polyethylene plastic um, or uh, bituminous geomembrane. There, there's a number of different types of impermeable layers that could go in here. Uh, they put on, uh, as a uh, security blanket, they put a, a clay layer on there and then clay mixed with sandy gravel and then a topsoil layer and then the vegetative cover on top of that. And the thinking here is that infiltrating water will hit this low permeability soil uh, with the clay mixed with sandy gravel. Um, and the root up, uh, the rooting of the plants won't penetrate it and um, evapotranspiration will remove whatever infiltrating water occurs. And if any water gets through, then it gets intercepted by the clay layer and the geotextile layer and the water and oxygen don't get down into the tailings. So this is a very sophisticated cover design, but it shows you sort of the state of the art and, and how these covers have evolved over time. Not, this is not always required depending on the nature of the material. And that, then we get back to the characterization process and, and how to adequately characterize these materials. And then you decide on your, before you even put the tailings in the impoundment, you've decided on what your cover design is, or you try trial plots uh, during operations to see how they perform. So the other solution is a water cover. And this is a little bit closer to home. This is in Elliott Lake here. Um, and this is while the mines were in, in operation. You can see the, uh, the tailings area out in the background here. Um, and this, this is active thick and the mining is still, still underway here. And then you can see this slide um, and this is post closure. So all the mine infrastructure has been removed. The tailings area is out here. And you can see that they're maintaining a water cover here. And you can see the tailings dam along this way. Um, and for, they, they chose a, a water cover here for a number of reasons. One uh, was because of the geological nature of the tailings there, but also because Elliott Lake was a uranium mine, and this was a, a, the tailings have uh, residual radionuclides in them. So the, uh, the purpose of the cover is to protect um, the aquatic environment and uh, any sensitive receivers from, uh, and people accessing the site from uh, the radio, low level radionuclides. Um, this is an in perpetuity um, arrangement. Uh, essentially, they're going to be managing these things for a very long period of time. So the tailings dams, um, the, uh, the water that is on the tailings, the surplus water, I mean, in the Canadian Shield, we, we live in what we call a positive water balance. So um, uh, a pond that you create will overflow because it will receive more inputs than evapotranspiration will remove. And so uh, that this water is collected and it goes through treatment systems prior to discharge. And those treatment systems and the, the monitoring and management of the tailing stands will continue for a very long period of time. Um, so the next slide I'm gonna show you, I took uh, while I was standing, this 
they're right about here on this this tailings down. So just just on that long straight arm there. And this is what the cover looks like. And you can see the um, the, the tailings down is where the road is. Um, it drops off to the left, and you can see the water cover out here. And it looks just like a lake. Um, the, the near shore area has been covered with um, other soil so that uh, when during the low water, um, the, uh, the the tailings don't get exposed. Um, but typically, this is uh, this is how a, a water cover would would look on um, when when that's selected as an option for a permanent cover for for mine tail. Um, the challenge is, is that you'll always have a dam. If you can, if you can get it to so that it's not the dams aren't holding water, um, you don't have to risk uh, as nearly as much risk of uh, a, a dam failure due to uh, piping or um, uh, structural failure of the of the on the on the dam. Uh, another uh, shot of the the Camp Kosha mine here. You can see the. Um, this is how they looked before the rehabilitation rehabilitation project uh, uh, was implemented. Uh, the tailings were were unconfined. Uh, there there were shell of confinements, but uh, tailings were everywhere. There were there were a number of different tailings areas that were utilized, all acid generating. Um, and you can see the, the the pond here is is impacted water, um, and then that sophisticated multi layer cover was placed over top of it. Um, and you can see the, the vegetated surface here. Now, the, um, you can see that the, the, the vegetated surface is disturbed here. That was uh, uh, to facilitate the installation of fencing. The, the fencing became necessary because uh, the local cottagers um, felt that this was still their, their playground and they were going out on their, that sophisticated cover um, and they're going out with their quad runners and, um, and side-by-sides and dirt bikes and they were chewing up the cover. And it was putting the integrity of the com cover for work uh, at risk. So uh, the solution was to uh, was to fence it off. Um, we can't stop humans from being humans. Sometimes I think um, another before and after picture. This is from the Conyorum mine. This is in Timmins. Uh, this is the former tailings area here. Um, these were acid generating. Uh, again, the site was largely used for um, as a playground uh, for dirt bikes, quad runners, and the like. It also looks like uh, somebody was extracting uh, some of the material for use as aggregate somewhere or uh, for some purpose. Um, in this case, it was privately held, and but the mining company that owned the rights to it uh, uh, undertook a rehabilitation project, and that's what it looks like now. Uh, they confined the tailings, they installed tailings dams, they put a cover on and revegetated the area, and they added um, interpretive trails um, about the reclamation project and wildlife viewing areas uh, because it's it's been colonized by a number of bird species and bird watchers go there quite frequently. Now in the background you can see the, the this tailings area here is from the dome mine and it's still an active tailings area so it hasn't been rehabilitated yet, but this is the uh, this is another image of what can be achieved in, in naturalizing um, what was once a, a mine hazard and bringing it up uh, to a, a functional landscape. Um, the, the scars are still there, but um, this is a much better scenario than what you've seen in the, the previous slide. So I'm, I'm getting close to the end here, so bear with me. Um, when you have uh, tailings areas, uh, or uh, impacted water, um, you have to do something with the discharges. Uh, mine effluent discharges are largely governed by the metal mine effluent regulation, uh, which is federal. Uh, that applies during operations. Um, and there's also an environmental compliance approval, which is required provincially. And there may be other permits and approvals uh, required depending on the nature of your treatment work. Um, but both establish receiving water-based discharge requirements uh, during operations and uh, have monitoring and reporting uh, provisions. Uh, and they're also frequently inspected by both the federal and provincial uh, regulatory bodies. Now, post-closure, the Mining Act requires that post-closure discharges meet either the provincial water quality objectives, uh, a background water quality that's been scientifically demonstrated, or a scientifically developed criteria that's acceptable to the regulatory agencies. And that uh, scientifically 
developed criteria can include uh, provision of a mixing zone. And a mixing zone is a, is a section of the receiving water that where mixing of the effluent is allowed to further attenuate and mitigate the impacts. Um, and it allows a, a small scale disturbance uh, if there's sufficient assimilative capacity in the receiver to do so. And, and essentially part of the water course becomes part of the, the treatment work. And they have to meet their uh, treatment objectives once you're downstream of the mixing zone. Um, so the most common for acid rock drainage and metal leaching is to treat it with lime or, uh, 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 or, or something similar. So in the treatment plant, um, typically the acid rock drainage would come in. Um, note that these are stainless steel pipes because of the low pH. Um, and then it would be mixed with the lime or slate lime, and then it would go into thickening tanks. Now the lime uh, forms hydroxide, and uh, which has a high affinity for metals. And the hydroxide ions combine the metals and form metal hydroxide sludges. And then these are collected in these tanks like this. And, and then the, uh, the, the water is uh, decanted off and, and uh, either for further treatment or direct discharge, depending on what the quality is. Um, and then the slimes have to be dealt with. Um, if it's an open pit operation, the slimes are often put in the, in the bottom of the open pit because uh, they'll be sequestered there and the, um, it, it's unlikely that they will um, uh, react and release the metals. Or it goes to uh, a secure containment facility like a lined um, landfill um, that's covered and capped to prevent um, mobilization of the, of the metals from it. And, uh, and that's at the, the tail end of the, the treatment system. Quite often, um, line treatment has to uh, continue post-operations for an extended period of time. So we're into pumps and pipes and tanks and treatment and disposing of treatment waste uh, for an extended period of time. And this has to be anticipated at the start of the mine planning sequence and, um, and planned for and financed as part of the uh, overall mine finance. So um, that basically wraps it up. I've taken you cradle to grave through um, a whole pile of uh, um, mining related stuff. Uh, we looked at uh, mineral exploration, we looked at the regulatory aspects of exploration and mine closure. Um, and we covered a lot of topics between now and uh, slide 36. So I'll leave you with this rehabilitated open pit from, uh, from British Columbia and uh, open it up for any questions. And I have a little thank you here for bearing with me and he bears out on the tailings area there. So thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Rob, for um, that very informative webinar. It was really interesting. Um, a lot of topics that I'm not that familiar with. Um, it's really interesting to see how mines are dealt with uh, after operations. Um, so if anyone has any questions, please, uh, you can just unmute yourself and ask. Um, there were a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, I'm just trying to figure out where they went. Okay, here we go. Um, kind of, they were just sort of put up throughout the presentation. So, and you might have answered them already, Rob, but <laughs> I'll just read it, read them out to you. So the first question was, how is water quality measured from the tailings and mining operation? Is it still the is it still the effect on trout to see if they survive? Um, I think uh, Ron, Ron's talking about the single concentration acute lethality test or the SCALP test. Um, that is um, one um, one aspect uh, that determines the lethality of uh, the effluent. So they take a sample. Of the um, of the effluent, and they put daphnia, which is like a, a water flea, and rainbow trout in it, and they leave them in there for a period of time. I believe it's 24 hours, and then they count how many of the organisms are still alive. And if you're um, over the 50% fatality, then it's considered non-toxic. Um, if you're under, or I mean, I'm sorry, if you're over 50% fatality, then it's toxic. Considered toxic to aquatic life. 
I'm, I'm a groundwater guy and a, and a, and a, and a, uh, and a geochemist. So that, that's uh, surface water, but that's my understanding of it. It's not my area of specific expertise. Um, but there's a whole suite of other parameters, um, you know, dissolved metals, uh, major cations, anions, dissolved oxygen temperature that are also monitored for, for water quality, Ron. And it's not just the single, um, single concentration acute lethality test. That's one, one valuable tool that we have, though, for sure. Okay, perfect. Well, Ron has another question here in the chat. Um, must the company deposit sufficient funds to cover the closure plans? Are the closure plans open to input from the public or environmental agencies? And I guess part of that is also, oh, well, there's a few aspects to this question. So I don't know if you want to address that first. <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh... The, the financial assurance is posted as a bond. They can post it. Um, there's in the Mining Act. There's three ways that they can um, they can use it, or or the or they can come up with an arrangement that's uh, suitable to the director. Um, who right now under uh, the, the changes recent changes to the Mining Act, I believe the director is now the minister. But uh, the um, uh, the most common way that's affordable for mining companies to provide financial assurance is through a bond. So they go to an insurance company and they uh, take out a bond that they, they pay just like you and I would for um, our house insurance. And, um, and then if uh, they, uh, it, it's almost like Freedom 55. If the, the bond isn't actualized and they don't, uh, um, uh, it's not needed by the Crown to implement uh, the mine closure, uh, the company has access to those funds. And, uh, but if they, if they exit the stage, then the crown has that, we realize on the bond and we have the funds available, well, the crown, I'm no longer we, I'm retired from the civil service. So um, the, uh, the crown has the funds available to uh, undertake the mine rehabilitation. Okay. Um, the second part of the question was, I've got the, I've got the chat open, Corrine, so. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, um, uh, are mine close, closure plans open to public input uh, from uh, public or environmental agencies? And absolutely they are. They're posted on the environmental registry uh, for a public comment period. Um, and often in communities, they're, uh, uh, they're directly en engaged with by the mining company for public and indigenous and Métis community input on the closure plan in and of itself. Uh, so they're all instruments that are required to be posted on the environmental registry. Okay, so there's another, he has other questions kind of related to that. Um, does the yeah. government inspect the mine site regularly after closure? And can the government call the company back to cover any environmental issue after closure? Uh, yeah, there is a compliance arm of the uh, Ministry of Mines. Um, they have inspectors that go out. I'm not sure what their current inspection cycle is. Um, it used to be every five years uh, that they would do uh, mines on average, um, and they they at one time took a risk based approach to it. But I'm not I'm not quite sure what they uh, what their inspection cycle is now. But there are compliance officers and there are compliance tools that they use. Um, yes, the can the company call the can the government call the company back to cover any environmental issue after closure? Um, well, typically. Uh, we wouldn't, the government wouldn't let them off the hook. Uh, they, they call that an exit ticket until the mine is deemed closed out. And that's a high bar. And there, there aren't very many mines in Ontario that have reached that closed out status. So as long as there's a viable uh, mining company associated with the project, they're responsible for implementing the mine closure plan. And if they don't, then there's actions that the Crown can take with respect to non-compliance. Um, the... Uh, in the case where a company has gone uh, insolvent or uh, filed for bankruptcy, uh, what I've seen happen is the uh, uh, the receiver or the trustee in bankruptcy will um, liquidate all the assets and the, uh, the property itself will get moved to a shell company and then the shell company will be bankrupted and uh, abandon the property. And then, then it'll revert to the crown, and the crown can then realize on the financial assurance and start implementing mine closure. Okay, so another question there was um, also from Ron. 
how would a mine closure prevent contamination of groundwater? Well, typically the um, assessment of uh, the potential for impacts to groundwater is, is done at the uh, planning stages for the mine. And so these areas where you're going to put acid generating materials um, are assessed for their hydraulic conductivity, baseline chemistry and things like that. Um, and the, um, the design of a waste rock pile or a tailings pile is, uh, is incorporated to prevent the uh, impact to uh, groundwater. Or at least if there, if there is going to be seepage into the groundwater, then it can be mitigated um, and there's monitoring programs in place. Uh, okay, so um, another question is how can we safely store radioactive materials in mine shafts in the Canadian Shield? That's a really loaded question. <laughs> um, I, I would argue that um, storing radioactive material, I wouldn't say in mine shafts, but in an appropriately designed and engineered enclosure in an appropriately engineered um, storage facility is, is quite feasible. Um, I know that um, that viewpoint probably wouldn't be popular with a lot of people that live near sites where uh, they're proposing these facilities. Um, the risk is always that you've got an engineered structure or an engineered um, feature on the landscape. And are there measures to maintain that and monitor it and ensure that it uh, stays um, safe uh, without causing um, outward migration over a really extended period of time uh, is, is really the issue. And, and where do you draw the line on whether or not the engineering is sufficient? I'm not sure I can answer that. Um, I think it can be done. Um, I just don't know where the boundaries for it are. Okay. And that's the geologist and geochemist <laughs> that's answering that question. <laughs> well, great. Thank you for answering that. And then the last question that Ron has in the chat is, is the effluent treated by dilution suitable for drinking? Uh, Ron and I need to go out for a coffee. We can have coffee. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, it isn't just uh, dilution. Um, there's, there's the, the, the final stage of treatment would be that, um, that mixing zone that I discussed in the, um, uh, in, in the talk. And, and so there's a whole pile of treatment there. Um, I, I will tell you that you can treat to a high water quality standard and it is achievable. I know that, that I was at the Kid Creek mine um, a few years ago in, in Timmins and we were getting a tour there we were talking about their closure measures that they were implementing and uh, at the time they hadn't finished uh, covering or capping their tailings area and um, they but they were in implementing mine closure there the mine was wrapping up operations and uh, as part of the tour we went down to the final discharge um, of their effluent and um, the director of operations there was with us and we went down and we're standing on this platform and he took a cup out of his pack sack and he filled it up from the effluent and drank it in front of us. Ooh. Impressive. And so um, I thought, I don't know if I would do that, but it showed that he had a lot of confidence in their, uh, their treatment uh, uh, system and the capacity for it to produce uh, uh, potable water or drinkable water at their discharge site. So it is, uh, it is probably uh, possible to treat to a high level. Okay, well, that's all of the questions. Well, Ron, Ron Dorst has his hand up. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I ahead. just wanted to clarify. Can you hear me? Yep. Can you hear me? Okay, yep. I just wanted to clarify. I think the regulatory uh, requirements are to meet provincial provincial water quality objectives, which are surface water as opposed to drinking water objectives. So, sure. I think the short answer is it, it they, it's not required to meet the drinking water requirements. But uh, yeah, thanks. That's a retired civil servant saying <laughs> that as well. So. You're right. You're right. Um, uh, potable water isn't uh, necessarily meeting. Uh, uh, and it wouldn't meet uh, drinking water objectives uh, for, for a lot of parameters. Yeah, thanks, Ron. Uh, that's good clarification. 
Okay, did anyone else have any questions? Okay, doesn't sound like it. So with that, I guess we will um, call the night a close. So I thank everyone for joining and thank you, Rob, for your very informative presentation. Really appreciate you doing that. And um, so just to let you know, we won't be holding a webinar in December, uh, but we will be doing one at the end of January. So stay tuned for um, that uh, subject. We'll, we'll release that when we put out our events calendar on January 1st. Um, but yeah, so thanks everyone for joining and I uh, hope you have a great night. Thanks for having me.